Good morning and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Francis Steed Sellers, a senior writer here at The Post. Today we're going to be talking about digital health. And my first guest today is the president-elect of the American Medical Association, Dr. Jack Resnick. Dr. Resnick, a very warm welcome to Washington Post Live. Thanks so much and thanks for having me today. We're delighted to have you. I'd like to start by talking about what we've learned about telemedicine uh, from the pandemic. What did COVID-19 show us about the value of telemedicine? Well, it really, during an otherwise very difficult time for the nation, for the world, and for healthcare, was an example of a shining success. In a very short period of time, we went from telemedicine and digital health being a very small portion of how we delivered care to in a matter of weeks being a way that we were delivering care to millions of patients uh, around the country. It, it um, really was a chance, uh, once the coverage got turned on, it really was a chance for physicians across multiple specialties, all across medicine, to really quickly figure out where it was best deployed, when we could use it best, and in which circumstances patients needed to come in in person. And I think as we talked to our patients, they really liked it. Um, they saw benefits far beyond just being able to avoid leaving the home because of COVID and achieve social distancing. It was a great way to improve access and convenience. Patients didn't have to be in cars or public transportation to get to offices. They missed less work. They had fewer issues with childcare in order to come to the, see their physician. We had patients in rural settings who don't have great access to physicians who got to see us more, more easily. So it really was a shining success story. So I'd like to ask first about primary care and then we'll talk about specialties, but I've heard in interviews doctors tell me it can be almost like doing a home visit and that you can see inside somebody's home if you're in telemedicine. But tell me, with primary care, is telehealth here to stay? Absolutely. I think it's going to be an integrated part of the way that we deliver care. There are obviously certain instances where it's really nice to have a patient in the office, to be able to do a physical exam, to be able to have some in-person counseling. At the early stages of the pandemic, though, about 44% of all of Medicare's primary care visits were actually being done by virtual means. You mentioned getting to sort of look into somebody's living setting. I think as we think about disparities and all of the challenges our patients are facing with food insecurity and housing insecurity and other things that actually affect their health and the diseases that they have and that we manage, we had a lot of instances where actually getting to see somebody live in their home setting made a difference. If you're seeing a patient in primary care with diabetes, for example, and you're talking to them about their diet and what they're eating, they can literally carry their iPhone or their laptop over to their refrigerator and you can talk about the food that's right there in front of them and ways to maybe change their diet. So we saw a lot of examples uh, where actually it was useful to take a look right into those social determinants of health. So then let's talk about some of the more um, specialized areas, cancer, neurology, some of these other areas. Are there disadvantages to virtual care in, in uh, very specialized areas? It really depends on, on the patient and what they're bringing to you and their condition. So I happen to be a dermatologist. And so you would think skin would be an easy thing for telehealth. And in many instances it is. Patients can show us things on a video or upload photographs. And we're a specialty that actually had been doing telehealth for years before the pandemic, although it dramatically increased with the pandemic. Um, but we quickly realized, and, and as I was sitting there on my computer doing a lot of telehealth visits, that there were certain patients, a patient I knew well where I was seeing them to maybe check in on how their condition was doing, update their medications, make some changes in their treatment where the telehealth was fantastic. There are other times where I was seeing a patient who had a couple of skin cancers in the past and we really needed to do a full body skin check and look for new skin cancers where it turned out not to be as useful and I really needed to see them in person or maybe I needed to do a biopsy that required seeing them in person. So I think we've learned a lot during this year and a half about exactly which patients it's great for and, and which patients we really need to bring into the office. So you're drawing these clinical distinctions which are very interesting between what you can do and what you can't do. Um, should a, a telehealth visit cost the same as bringing somebody into the hospital? Are they are they equivalent in those? Um, I would say in some ways it depends. So when you think about, uh, we really think about payment as just being 
a, a way to sort of fairly compensate for the amount of work and overhead that's involved in, in providing a particular service. So if you're doing the equivalent of an in-person visit and you're spending the amount of time and, and diagnosing a complex thing, and by the way, most physicians who are doing a mix of integrated telehealth and keeping their office open and keeping their nursing staff and front desk staff present, you can imagine that might be valued similarly. You can imagine other services that are quite distinct that are done differently by telehealth where the amount of resources that go into providing that service might be a little bit different. So, uh, you know, th this is obviously an issue that's um, gone to the Hill. Do you support efforts from lawmakers to keep expansions on telemedicine permanent? Uh, if so, with what conditions? And if not, why not? Absolutely, I do. This is critical. I don't think my patients want to go back to the way things were a year and a half ago when this wasn't an option. And it really was the expanded coverage that made this possible. So within a matter of weeks, we saw both government insurers like Medicare and Medicaid and private commercial insurers really open this up and turn on coverage for telehealth that hadn't existed before the pandemic that allowed us to be able to provide that care to our patients. It turns out that for Medicare, there are some really old rules that date back to the 1990s, this thing called Section 1834M, that essentially said before the pandemic that you could, as a Medicare patient, could only use audiovisual telehealth if you were in certain geographic areas and if you went to one doctor's office to see another doctor via telehealth. You couldn't use your own device at home. And this may have made sense back in 1997 when it was put in place, but it really doesn't make sense today for patients to have to do that. And so those rules were waived during this public health emergency. And we have been really encouraging Congress uh, to make those changes permanent so that patients can continue to use telehealth. We've seen some similar issues with the commercial private insurers. A lot of them before the pandemic had some telehealth services. For example, some of my patients who I knew well weren't allowed to do a follow-up visit with me via a video visit, if, even if they lived two or three hours away, but their insurance company gave them access to some internet-based corporate telehealth provider with physicians or other clinicians that they'd never met who didn't have access to their records. So we'd like to see them expand and continue the option for our patients to be able to, to see the healthcare uh, team and the physicians that they already know and who know them. So one of the things that the pandemic has highlighted is health inequities across the country. And you mentioned that earlier on in terms of getting into people's houses and understanding uh, the, the unique problems they face. But many people in this country don't have broadband. How are you going to ensure moving ahead with telemedicine that it's available in an equitable way to people from all different backgrounds across this country? You're right. Those inequities and the disparities that we see in outcomes certainly aren't new, but I think the pandemic made them visible to large uh, portions of the American population that maybe hadn't been aware of them before we really saw unconscionable dis disproportionate impacts of the pandemic on our black population, our brown patients, our Native American communities. Um, and, and telehealth is a part of improving that, but it has to be done in a way where from the very beginning, you build in on ramps to help patients get access to it. And you really think about those disparities and that equity up front. So I was really surprised as I was providing care via telehealth, just how many people had limited broadband access. So, for example, I had farm workers who were using the telephone to be able to get care directly from the fields. And maybe that was less surprising, but I had patients both in urban and rural settings who, for example, didn't have access to or couldn't afford uh, broadband internet access. I had patients who had wildly different sort of levels of digital literacy in terms of how comfortable they were. So the tools have to be made in ways that a wide variety of patients feel comfortable using them and have access to them. We have to have broadband access. We have to have insurers actually cover this so that patients um, across the spectrum have access uh, to these services. Another thing that we don't want to see in terms of, of a problem potentially with health equity on telehealth is we also don't want insurance companies telling individual groups of patients, 
that either they can't use telehealth or that that they have to use telehealth or have to pay extra to come in in person because as we mentioned earlier there are times where it's actually really useful to see a patient face to face as well so one of the points of contention over telehealth has been over licensing and where doctors practice um could you tell me about your views on this and why you oppose, I believe, making permanent some of the uh, relaxation of those rules that happened during the pandemic? Well, licensure is really, the, ma the main function of licensure is that it allows states in the current setup to really hold physicians accountable for the care they provide. And it means that if I have a patient who's unhappy with my care and I happen to practice in California, my patients can go to the licensing board in California and make a complaint or ask them to look into something I've done. And all of the rules of the road uh, around end of life care, around medical marijuana, around reproductive care, all these things are really set at the state level um, through that system. And one of our concerns is that if you all of a sudden say physicians are licensed federally or, or only have to be licensed in the state where they're providing care, all of a sudden, if I am caring for a patient in Florida and that patient has concerns about the care I've provided, they have to come all the way to the California Medical Board uh, to file a complaint against me. So that's one of the important reasons we really believe in state licensure. It turns out that there are a lot easier ways, though, now to practice across state lines. So there's this thing called the Interstate uh, State Medical Licensure Compact, which essentially says, OK, I have a good license in California. I don't have complaints filed against me. A number of other states across the country, if California were to participate in this, I can now easily get licenses in multiple states. So that way I'm held accountable when I provide care to patients in those areas. Another thing that we're asking the state medical boards to do from the AMA is to say, look, if you already know a patient who's seen you in person or who you've provided telehealth to locally in your own state, and that patient happens to be away in college or off on vacation or a snowbird who's in a different state for a while, it's perfectly reasonable to continue to provide care to that patient while they're out of state. Just to sort of get down to brass tacks, I was talking just recently with a, a nurse practicing in rural Maine who does telehealth, and she said, you know, there's a neurologist she works with at, in Boston, um, but that person isn't licensed in Maine. It, it seems like a huge roadblock for some rural communities, particularly if you're close to a state line, um, not to be able to have these cross-state uh, It can be. There, yeah, there are a lot of workarounds for that. So I mentioned this interstate compact. There are also regions of the country where, particularly in rural areas, where multiple states get together and, and honor each other's licenses across local state lines and where there's enforcement is actually quite possible because the region works together on it. There's also a way that, so, you know, I happen again to be a dermatologist where I can do what's called an interprofessional consult where a patient goes to see their primary care physician maybe out of state and that primary care physician can do a consult with me about that patient and that way the patient has a local person who's there if they have a problem so the person who's actually prescribing their medications and doing some of the follow-up is their local physician that they have access to if they have a side effect or, or need a backup plan for local care but I can assist in sort of thinking through their management plan because another one of the challenges sometimes with telehealth and when it's done well this works great but when it's done sort of poorly and again we see this with some of these corporate internet internet based sites is that you have situations where a patient gets a prescription from across state lines something goes wrong and they have a side effect and they have nowhere to go so i'll have patients call my office saying you know i got my eczema treated by this online provider who happens to be across the country. They're not available today. Can you see me in your office? Because now I'm having a problem with the medication they prescribed. So it's really useful when you also have a physician in your state who's helping to take care of you. And they can also utilize the specialty and subspecialty care across state lines, which, which the rules permit. So I, I want to ask one more question about this licensure because it's so complicated. A recent disaster, of course, was across the country, but I've covered stories like the pulse shooting in Florida, where doctors, specialists could not fly in from other areas to help doctors who are under extreme uh, pressure there to treat emergencies. Does that make sense or should we be relaxing licensure? In no, and clearly this is, this is important. There are all types that you mentioned that uh, terrible tragedy. There are all types of emergencies, natural disasters, all kinds of things where we see physicians actually 
and other members of the healthcare team eager to really run towards the fire and provide care. I had, uh, I work at a, a hospital called UCSF in San Francisco early on in the pandemic when we weren't having a lot of COVID cases in California yet. Um, we actually put a lot of our physicians and nurses on planes to go to New York where things were worse and to go to the Navajo Nation where things were worse early on. Um, and, and it was incredibly moving to watch that. We've seen a lot of states and state medical boards make allowances during uh, declared emergencies to allow physicians to come in and practice across state lines. And we need to continue uh, to fix those rules so that that continues to be to be possible in emergencies. So one of the, the, the huge triumphs uh, of this pandemic has been technological in the uh, invention of the mRNA vaccines. Do you see them as a game changer going ahead in the way medicine is uh, able to deal with infectious disease? Yeah, I mean, there have been there have been a number of silver linings in this pandemic. And I think in addition to telehealth being one, science has really been a winner in the last year and a half. The speed with which these vaccines have come about. Um, I think healthcare workers and watching what they did during this pandemic has been another really inspiring success story. It's been interesting reading about some of the potential uh, new applications of mRNA vaccines. As you know, they've they've been around for a while, but this was really a first in terms of such a successful deployment and, and the way that they can be quickly designed uh, for tip for particular uses, I think is really exciting. And I, I look forward to seeing where that goes as we think about applying them to other diseases. And then uh, talk to me a little bit, if you could, about um, artificial intelligence, its role and the AMA's uh, standing on uh, on how it can be integrated into care. It's pretty exciting. Um, we have seen across multiple specialties really cool early applications of AI. Um, but as with anything in healthcare or frankly in anything else, you see great tools and you see some pretty lousy tools out there as well. So we try to start at the beginning with every one of these ideas and often they're accompanied by a fair bit of hype with some really basic questions. Does it work? Does it do what it actually says it's going to do? And is it going to be actually useful to physicians and to our patients even if it works? Is it going to ultimately improve their their health. Um, we've seen examples where sometimes the hype doesn't pan out. Their uh, augmented intelligence basically requires computers to learn from what's called a training set. So they take a big data set, whether it's a ton of pictures or a ton of electronic health records, and they go learn from things that have happened in the past to try to help us predict the future. So for example, you see really neat applications where you look at hospitalized patients and AI is sort of combing their medical records while they're in the hospital and can help us predict, for example, which pneumonia patients in the hospital might do poorly and need more attention early on. But sometimes the tools looking back kind of learn the idiosyncras idiosyncrasies of, of the place where they're being taught. So for example, there was a tool like this that learned that patients who come to the hospital who have a pneumonia, but who also have really bad asthma, actually do really well and don't need extra attention, even though they have asthma. And it learned that because those patients at that hospital, if you had asthma, got immediately taken to the intensive care unit and got all this extra care. And so it sort of learned something that was maybe wrong and wouldn't necessarily apply to another hospital. I've got another example just in my own field of dermatology where we had an AI tool um, that helped us look at a mole on a patient. So this is a dark growth on a patient's skin that could potentially be a skin cancer or not. And it would help you decide, does this lesion really need a biopsy? And this is an exciting use of AI. I think it's going to get better and better. But it turned out we figured out months later that this tool had learned that if physicians had drawn a circle around the dark mole, that was more likely to predict one that they were worried about before they took a picture. And that was one of the things it was using to actually guess whether the patient had a melanoma. So I think we have to be careful too about these tools. Um, there are also some equity issues. I don't know if we have a, a moment to discuss that where, where we're also worried about these tools being deployed equitably and not sort of cementing mm -hmm. existing inequities in the healthcare system. There's an Optum, a large company, put out a tool, again, with, with good intentions, I think, that was designed to help us predict, to help um, insurers and healthcare systems predict which patients in the next year 
might get sicker and need more healthcare resources directed at them to prevent their chronic diseases from getting worse and to prevent hospitalizations. Great idea. But the tool had learned from the way we had delivered healthcare the last few years. And it learned that minoritized populations got less healthcare. And so it took what it learned from that. And actually, if you gave this tool the exact same health background of a, a black patient and another patient who was a non-minority patient, it would direct more resources to the non-minority patient. So there are real dangers and if we don't design these tools really properly and thinking about health equity from the outset, it's, it's really important that we think about it uh, at the front end. That's fascinating. I want to ask one quick last question, if I may. Um, the White House conceded this week that it would not reach its goal of 70% vaccination rate for the adult population. What, in your view, does that mean for the country's recovery? And I'm sorry, a big question, but if you could answer it briefly, yeah. it would be cool. Well, I, we've made tremendous progress and are incredibly fortunate uh, to have had vaccines so quickly and to have uh, the great uptake that we've seen. We still have uh, patients that we're talking to who are hesitant. And fortunately, many of them, as they talk to their physicians, learn more about the benefits of the vaccines. Um, maybe have some of the stuff that they've read on social media countered that's, that's not true out there. We're, we're still very optimistic about the progress we're making, and we really urge everyone out there, particularly with the new Delta variant increasingly circulating around the world and, and now in the U.S. as well, those patients who aren't vaccinated are going to be at particularly higher risk, I think, in the coming months. So um, we'd love to see continued progress. That's all we have time for, Dr. Resnick. Thank you so much for such a fascinating discussion. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. I'll be back in a few moments with uh, Dr. John Brownstein from Boston Children's and Dr. Tufaya Haddad from the Mayo Clinic. The world is full of challenges. And at MITRE, we're ready to take them head on. We're a world-class team of innovators, thought leaders, visionaries, and doers. We know we are called to do more, to do better, think differently, and move faster. And at MITRE, we're meeting those challenges every day. Hello, I'm Jean Meserve. During the pandemic, we were advised to stay away from hospitals and doctor's offices as much as possible unless we were suffering from COVID-19. For many of us, telemedicine and other forms of digital health care were a blessing. They allowed us to continue to communicate with our health care providers. So what did we learn from this? Here to discuss is Dr. Jay Schnitzer. He is Chief Technology and Medical Officer at MITRE. Dr. Schnitzer, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jean. Great to be with you. So from your perspective, what were the big takeaways from our experiment with digital health during the pandemic? So although we've known about the challenges for digital health for many years, COVID-19 served as a wake-up call about just how vulnerable we are as a country, as a globe, in fact, to rapidly spreading disease. COVID-19 has been both a catalyst and an accelerant, particularly for telehealth. The pandemic opened our eyes to broad health disparities across the nation. It also has underscored the glaring need for a national digital health strategy. It has amplified that need and identified, illuminated, and magnified the gaps between here and where we need to be. It is our responsibility now to make sure that the lessons learned over the past year prepare us for the next global health emergency and improve the health and well-being of all Americans every day. Now that the imperative to use these digital tools has passed, do you worry that the momentum in this area will be lost? Not at all. I think we've seen just by what we've seen over the past year, year and a half, how valuable these tools are and how much they help, particularly telehealth, particularly for things such as mental health. And yes, we'll see some ebb and flow of that over the coming uh, months and years, but telehealth, digital health, they're here to stay and they are making a difference. You mentioned a national digital strategy for healthcare. What would that look like? Well, we actually put that together over the past several months in conjunction with our MITRE Health Advisory Council and identified 
six goals that need to be part of the strategy. They include access to universal broadband for everyone, a workforce that is tech savvy for healthcare delivery, digital technologies that work for the individual, different types of architectures and standards that can be used to create interoperability across the spectrum, a ecosystem, an ecosystem that supports public health and last and most important in many ways, the governance of all of this for the system to work. So if this national strategy were put in place, what advances do you think we'll see short term and also in the longer term? Well, in the near term, and by that I mean within a year or two at most, I think we should see some very quick wins that are going to matter. First, first of all, I think we are going to reach or we could reach ubiquitous, secure telehealth access and utilization for everyone. We could obtain appropriate levels of sustained, reliable reimbursement for telehealth, which would be the gasoline for the engine and keep us going. And equally importantly, we'll hope to reach a state in which our federal government assumes the leadership role for in this complex ecosystem and engages effectively with all components and stakeholders for, for telehealth and for digital health going forward. In the longer term, up to five years or more perhaps, we hope to see a transformed health ecosystem that leverages these digital technologies that improve health and well being for everyone. We would expect to see broadband access for everybody. We would expect to reach a state where information that is needed is available at the right time, in the right form, to the right people, wherever and whenever needed, securely, simultaneously preserving privacy and with the access controlled by the individual patient. Next, we would hope that we'd have a tech savvy workforce and finally, and most importantly, it would lead to improve, improved health for everyone. So expand capacity, improve health up, outcomes, reduce costs too, potentially? Should be. I mean, we've seen in many other industries where digital technologies ultimately lead to reduced costs. We haven't seen it yet in healthcare. And in a contrary fashion, usually in bringing digital technologies to health increases costs. But in the long run, we should see that with health as well as in under other areas. So, yes. And we have to leave it there. Dr. Jay Schnitzer, thanks so much for joining us, Chief Technology and Medical Officer at MITRE. I'm Jean Zerb. Now back to the Washington Post. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, I'm Francis Deed Sellers. This next segment is going to focus on the new frontier in medicine, smart hospitals. And I have two experts joining me today, Dr. John Brownstein from Boston Children's and Dr. Tufaya Haddad from the Mayo Clinic. A very warm welcome to you both. Good to see you. Thank you. John, let's start with you um, and paint the big picture. If you could design the smart hospital of the future, what would it look like? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we've been on this digital journey at Boston Children's now for, you know, at least a decade now, um, recognizing that the data that we are collecting in the process of taking care of our patients can actually be fundamentally used to actually make better decisions. So, Yes, you know, when you think about a smart hospital, it's really fundamentally just optimizing technology to support a better experience for patients, you know, really a concierge 
true experience like we see in other industries. It's about automation. It's about in taking away all those administrative tasks from our providers so that they can practice at the top of their license. It's really all about thinking about how we improve clinical decision making. The EMR is full of huge amounts of information, but we don't actually leverage it to the best of its possibility to really build sort of a clinical intelligent system. And so there are so many areas of the hospital that could be transformed with sort of the intelligence that we have in the data, whether it's radiology, pathology, whether it's in the emergency department. We're already embarking on that, but it really changes the game in terms of how we support our patients and really thinking about it like we would any other industry where we leverage data about our populations to make better decisions. So I just want to remind EMR stands for a medical, yeah. um, sorry, ele electric medical records. I'm fumbling here. Um, we have some some listeners who probably won't know the the acronym, so we'll step back from that. To fire, um, the Mayo Clinic was just uh, ranked, I think, number one in the world as a smart hospital. Can you tell us what you're doing there to improve uh, both operational uh, functions and patient experience? Yes, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh... Uh, question and uh, recognition of, of this honor uh, at Mayo Clinic. We're very proud to be recognized amongst uh, these other wonderful health systems to be leading in the use of telemedicine, artificial intelligence, uh, robotic surgery, digital imaging, um, and having robust uh, information technology infrastructure and a shared uh, electronic health record system across our organization. Um, these investments in technology are really aimed to support um, the transformation uh, of healthcare. Um, and utilizing these technologies with that human touch, um, our incredible healthcare workforce, to really enable them to be more efficient, more effective, uh, more engaging um, in the care that they deliver. Um, I, I really believe that the smart hospital and hospital of the future really begins with how we are caring uh, for patients at home and leveraging these technologies uh, to do remote patient monitoring, to be assessing our patients' um, symptoms, their uh, vital signs, other physiologic um, data, uh, and to be assessing those, those data and information and using uh, robust data and analytics platforms to earlier identify adverse trends so that uh, our nurses and our teams who are monitoring, um, virtually monitoring these patients at home can uh, earlier intervene um, when problems arise, sometimes even before um, the patient feels different or notices symptoms. But we know from research that, that remote patient monitoring can uh, reduce the need for hospitalization, reduce total hospital days, reduce the need for hospital readmissions. And, and that is uh, a wonderful uh, benefit uh, in terms of improving our patient outcomes, um, reducing those hospital-associated um, infections, falls, deliriums, um, and allowing patients to remain in their home, the comfort and inconvenience of being in home. And all of this translates to reducing the total cost of care. So the smart hospital of, of the future really starts with, with monitoring of patients in the home to hopefully avoid the need uh, for them to be in our hospital. So John, to fire, use the phrase human touch, and there's evidence to show that spending time with your physician is actually beneficial, makes people better more quickly. Is there a balance here between operational efficiency and patient care in that traditional sense? Yeah, well, actually, I think that these things can go hand in hand. The idea that if you can optimize technology in the clinical environment, you actually create more human interaction. So if you think about um, documentation, so in the electronic medical record, a provider will spend the bulk of their time, both in the visit and after the visit, documenting the interaction that they had with a patient. That is time that is spent, that could be spent in direct engagement and in, in, in engagement with the patient themselves. We, for instance, are deploying now augmented listening devices in the clinical room. So the idea that you can actually listen to the conversation that happens between a provider and a patient and extract important elements from that conversation that can actually carry forward into the notes and the documentation of the patient in their electronic medical record. So that means is in fact, technology is optimizing the human-human the interaction. It's not taking away from it. And I think that's what we're seeing more and more is where can we 
take away all the sort of repetitive tasks that a provider is experiencing and make them more of a human engagement with their patient. I think that has to be fundamental to every technology that we look to deploy in our hospital setting. Thank yes, you. John, I, I agree with that comment. Um, we, we know that our clinicians uh, spend more time in front of the computer screens trying to abstract information from the EHR to guide their decisions um, at a two to one ratio, in fact. I think as we start to apply these um, advanced clinical decision support systems to do the data mining, the interpretation, find those insights for us, that will give us more time then to spend um, together with our patients in counseling and actually enhancing um, that face-to-face -face time, um, whether it's by video face-to-face -face or, or in our uh, hospitals and clinics. Um, so it's definitely an efficiency gain that allows our clinicians to do what they do best, and that's interact uh, with our patients. So you've been at the forefront, both of you at the forefront of these trends. How did the pandemic accelerate the move towards smart hospitals across the country? John, maybe you could start, but I'd love to hear from you to fire on that too. Yeah, no, I mean, clearly, as we heard from the, uh, from the previous discussion you had, I mean, it was essentially a game changer and one of the sort of major, the sim, you know, one of the few benefits of the pandemic we had a team in place, a digital health team in place at the hospital, but you know we were just seeing a trickling in the use of virtual care. Now, of course, with the pandemic, it forced us into an environment where we had to really deploy virtual visits, uh, you know, telemedicine at scale. Luckily, we had the underpinnings. And what was great is that our providers adapted to it incredibly well, and in fact, loved using these tools and our patients really love them as well so that you know the sort of the cat is out of the bag a little bit when it comes to these tools but it allowed us to do other things right like um we just you know had a conversation about remote patient monitoring we could bring devices into the home and do remote visits we could actually think about better ways of engaging with our patients after visits you know the ways in which we can continuously engage with our patients not sort of this one-off engagement so you know, it really did change our ability to engage with our patients. Of course, we had many technologies that we deployed because of the pandemic, which whether it's symptom ch checking or new devices to do screening of our patients. But overall, the tools that we've built will last far beyond the, the pandemic. Of course, there's going to be a conversation about whether there's going to be a willingness on the part of providers and patients to do this. I think there will be. Um, and then we just have to make sure that reimbursement stays with us so that, you know, that parity exists between an in-person visit and a virtual visit that, you know, so many of our patients have been asking for for many years. Tufai, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, thank you. I, I completely agree with uh, John's comments here. You know, the pandemic certainly was um, a catalyst. Um, adoption of, of telehealth and tel telemedicine and the hospital at home model really was limited in part by licensure, regulatory reimbursement um, barriers and some of the flexibilities that have uh, been enabled uh, in part due to the public health and emergency has allowed us for broad adoption and expansion now of these services. Um, so that definitely is part of it. There's been um, academic progress, um, research, studying the impact of um, these different ways to deliver health care. Um, we hope that the research and those outcomes and findings will allow us to um, sustain and gain uh, upon the momentum and hopefully to persist some of these uh, regulatory changes. Um, as well, you know, COVID-19 was so unique um, in, in that we wanted to keep as much care um, for our patients um, in the home to reduce transmission uh, of the virus. So enabling remote patient monitoring, you know, which historically had been developed to serve patients with chronic conditions. You know, during the pandemic, we saw this shift to now be managing acute conditions like COVID-19 um, with remote patient monitoring um, in the home. Our patients um, really loved this. They felt connected to their care teams. They felt we were paying attention to their symptoms, their, their um, oxygen saturation levels, um, responding to trends and making sure they felt supported on their uh, road to recovery. Um, and importantly for those um, who were experiencing uh, more severe symptoms or having some instability in their vital signs, we were able to um, early intervene uh, with different types of care interventions in the home 
that allowed us again to earlier reverse sort of the trajectory um, of their disease. But also, you know, we, we recognize that we can only go so far with monitoring in the home. We actually need to deliver care in the home as well. Um, and that is what the hospital at home model, um, something that Mayo Clinic has, has now invested in and now is uh, has the advanced care at home um, through our uh, strategic investment in partnership together with Kaiser Permanente, uh, investing in medically home, um, the te technology enabled services company and supply chain that allows us to bring and administer IV fluids, IV medications, perform some diagnostics as needed um, to help support and bring that hospital level care into the home. John. I was talking to Dr. Resnick about um, about disasters and doctors helping each other out and trying to move and, and go towards the disaster. But one of the things I learned about little about during the pandemic was doctors sharing information technologically, virtually. Is that a growing trend too? So doctor training, in effect, indirect patient care? Yeah, I mean, I think that the speed of information sharing broadly um, has changed, you know, like fundamentally right now. And I think it's it goes for clinical decision making, but also scientific research. I mean, we saw the advent of the preprint and the sort of outward sharing of data. As soon as we started understanding sort of the symptom set for, for COVID patients, that data was being made available freely. There was huge amounts of sort of aggregate information that was shared. You know, we, our team worked on a number of different surveillance tools, one around symptom checking um, and the ability to fully understand how to understand what a patient would be presenting with, what symptoms they would be presenting with that would indi indicate COVID, especially in light of lack of testing. And so that information was shared across many different types of social networks, ones that were more sort of physician-based like ProMed, uh, but also more broad social networks like, like Twitter. Um, and I think that is something that we're going to see uh, more uh, dramatically change over time. Now, the question again becomes, you know, how does one get sort of academic credit in this world of vast information sharing? You know, our promotions and, and academic sort of success depends on sort of traditional peer reviewed journal uh, articles. And that's how you get promoted through the academic ranks. But in a world where, you know, there's such vital need for information um, and the cutting edge of data to, you know, respond to a pandemic, but now, you know, for whatever next comes our way, I think we're going to have to think about ways in which, you know, providers by exposing information, by exposing data, still get that credit to move through uh, their own sort of professional journey. So a lot of open questions, but I do think, again, like um, digital health, um, our sharing of information is sort of fundamentally changed going forward. To far, Mayo has had this great honor of being so well ranked around the world. But when you look at other countries and other models elsewhere in terms of smart technology in hospitals, where do you look? Are there models out there that are that the US should look to? Well, I think uh, one of the the advantages I have seen uh, in other countries is just uh, a shared uh, electronic health record uh, throughout the country and the ability to share data and have that interoperability uh, amongst their different systems because everything is, is unified and shared. Um, that is certainly a, a distinct advantage that I see in other countries um, in terms of their ability to, to deliver um, telemedicine and to, to really use that as a primary driver um, for um, primary care, for specialty care um, as well, um, but then to harness all that data uh, and to be able to, to leverage it uh, in ways um, that we can develop uh, these predictive analytics um, in advanced clinical decision support. Um, they have kind of that unique uh, opportunity you know, leveraging very large data sets um, from uh, the many patients uh, in their country. Um, and so I think that is a, a unique uh, advantage that I see. Um, we certainly have limitations um, in our country with the lack of uh, complete interoperability because people are on uh, different electronic health records. Not all 
health systems yet even um, are on uh, electronic health records. But uh, that certainly poses the challenge for us to develop these um, large data sets um, to be doing some of this uh, additional work and development. Can you be just a little bit more specific about what those large data sets offer in these other countries? What what advantages specifically? Yeah, so, um, you know, leveraging the, the, the big data in order to um, develop these um, predictive a uh, algorithms um, and uh, turning those algorithms then into clinical decision support systems um, and integrating them into our clinical workflows. Mm -hmm. Um, an example, uh, uh, one that uh, actually we have here at Mayo Clinic was uh, the development of a predictive uh, model. Uh, we leveraged over 60,000 uh, electronic medical records from uh, individual patients to develop a model that uh, predicts for need for palliative care. Um, we were able to bring that model then into our clinical workflows in the hospital to identify patients who would benefit from having a palliative care team um, provide additional supportive care um, to help improve their health and their outcomes. Um, that's so so being able to develop that framework to develop not just one model but multiple models. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to be able to bring those uh, into the workflows in a seamless way that, it, again, allows our clinicians to be more effective in terms of the services they leverage um, for the patient's care uh, to help improve the, our patient's outcomes. We see that happening um, in our own country and in our own um, individual health systems. But the ability to share that uh, across multiple different um, health systems is where we have some limitations in the U.S. And I'll, yeah, you know, I'll just add maybe to that, um, you know, I think that the point of having the largest, most representative uh, data set to build algorithms, AI, machine learning tools is super important. And I know that, you know, there was there's conversations about bias in AI, right? The, the, the issue that you don't have a diverse or representative sample in order to sort of make these predictions. And that can lead to real problematic outcomes because your tools do not serve everyone equitably. We talked, you know, I know you talked about this a little bit in the previous session. So this advantage of potentially having a large health system for an, uh, an entire country means that you have much deeper representation across different groups. And in order to do that, then you, you know, of course, having more data means the algorithm is more robust, but having a broader representation also means. And then we've had this struggle even in our own, you know, hospital setting where, you know, if we only build a model just based on our own patients, how extendable is it to another pediatric hospital or to another country? And so the more that we can be inclusive in these tools, the better the algorithms are, but the better they'll serve all our patients. I think I have time for one question left for each of you and unfortunately rather quick ones. But John, you are um, working on the vaccine finder, which I think started right after H1N1 in 2009. Can you tell us what has happened with it? It's now a government uh, yeah. find for vaccines and whether uh, what role it's going to play now that we have heard from the White House that they will not, they think, reach 70 percent of adults vaccinated by July the 4th. Yeah, no. So we. Thanks for the question. We, we've been running a vaccine finder tool for, for many years. Um, we ended up becoming part of the sort of response with Operation Warp Speed and CDC to build the sort of integral data set that captures where vaccines are deployed, the, the supply chain of where essentially vaccines are across the country, across pharmacies and a variety of different types of vaccination sites. It, that ultimately transformed to vaccines.gov. Um, and it's been sort of the main tool that the White House and others have uh, focused on to drive people to figure out where to go in their community to get uh, vaccines. And it's been used over 25 million times. And it's been a, sort of a vital resource as part of this sort of strategy to, to get the, the vaccine deployed. Now, we are unfortunately probably going to miss it. Um, this is a problem, and there are multiple reasons for that. I highlight access as being an issue. Even though we have this vaccines.gov tool, still millions of people live in vaccine deserts. So there has to be a strategy to figure out how to reach you know, that last mile of people that are in low access environments. And so, yes, that July 4th deadline may not be within reach, but of course, it there's a highlight of certain states being well beyond that, that mark and many states, particularly many in the South, still have a real challenge. And so there's going to be, have to be a focus on thinking about how you take 
those populations of people that are on the fence and whether it's full vaccine authorization or other types of incentives. We know that paid leave or child care, certain types of incentives will work for certain populations. So there's still ways to go. And yes, we have the Delta variant emerging. So, it, you know, time is of the essence to get, you know, everyone immunized ahead of the surge that is coming later in the summer. Unfortunately, we're right out of time. I want to thank you both so much for joining me and for such an interesting conversation. John Brownstein from Boston Children's and Tufaya Haddad from the Mayo Clinic, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much for having me. And I'll be back in a few moments with HHS Secretary Javier Becerra. Heartedly uh, believe that we're going to be doing expansion of telehealth. COVID has taught us so much. Uh, it's also the issue of broadband, making sure communities have access to broadband. But if we don't learn from COVID how telehealth can help save lives, then we're in trouble. I'm back now with America's first Latino Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra. A very warm welcome to the show, Secretary Becerra. I think we may be having a little bit of trouble with sound. Uh-oh. Can you hear me now? Okay, I can hear you loud and clear now. A very warm welcome to the show. Thank you very much, I said, Francis. I appreciate you having me. Well, we're delighted. We're going to focus the show on digital health, but I do want to ask, first ask about the Supreme Court ruling. Uh, that must have been a great triumph in your view. And um, to ask specifically about what the next steps are um, in expanding health coverage. Where do we stand with a public option, which was something Biden campaigned on? So first, I think you have to say that common sense won in the Supreme Court. And as a result, now we can build president said it from the very beginning, he wanted to build on the successes of the Affordable Care Act. And so we've already begun that. Uh, the American Rescue Plan allowed us to expand coverage, uh, make it more affordable. So, so far, we've seen more than 1.2 million Americans sign up for coverage under the Affordable Care Act. That means that some 31 million Americans today now receive coverage as a result of the Affordable Care Act. That's a record number. Uh, we also see that uh, because of the special enrollment period that President Biden asked us to start. Over a million people are now applying for new coverage, better coverage. In some cases, we've seen over a million people now receive coverage at $10 a month in their premium costs, which is incredible when you think of the quality of care that they're going to be receiving. So we're going to continue that, continue to lower the price of, of that health care insurance. We want to continue to lower the price of prescription drug medication. We've got lots to do. So the public option again with a 50-50 Senate, where does that stand and what are the political, political prospects for it? The president is supporting the public option. Uh, I worked on passing the public option when we did the Public Care Act back in 2009-2010. And we will work closely with our colleagues in the Senate and the House to try to get something done. Public option, as you're aware, actually saves the American people and taxpayers money. It gives uh, Americans a choice, better choice, increased choice in terms of their different health insurance coverage, the kind of plan they want, by having a public option that looks a lot like what seniors in America Medicare, it's another chance that uh, Americans have to select the kind of health insurance they want to use. And the public option, very similar to Medicare, give Americans another. Secretary Becerra, I'm afraid we're having a little trouble with the audio soon. I know our technology team is working hard on this. But forgive me if I, I can hear you, we'll carry on. But forgive me if we miss a few sentences. I wanted to ask you as well about prescription drugs. This is another issue that the president campaigned on. Absolutely. 
Yeah, and hopefully you'll be able to hear me. I apologize if the technical problems are on our side, but uh, on a prescription drug medication, look, uh, many administrations have tried to tackle this. The previous administration tried to tackle this some as well. They're intent on doing this. It's, it's no longer to see how much Americans have for their prescription drugs, especially when we see counterparts in other countries using the same drug and paying less for those drugs in other countries. And so uh, the president is intent on working with Congress to lower the price of drugs. And where we have the, the authority already, we'll try to take action to lower the price of prescription drugs. You mentioned the large number of people who've enrolled. And of course, this is a huge change in uh, from the early days of the Affordable Care Act when there were problems with the website and enrollment. How has technology played and what technological improvements have happened to make this possible? Oh, technology is so much a ball game these days. Uh, without technology, you're a lot slower. You're not as nimble. And we're making use of technology every way we can. Uh, we've seen as a result of COVID how important it is to be able to reach folks. You played a clip about telehealth where I testified on the importance of telehealth moving forward. But we have to make sure we use technology the right way as well. We can't leave people behind simply because they can't afford the technology or the technology hasn't reached where they live. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone benefits from the utility of technology. And what we'll, what we'll see is that we're able to deliver care faster, cheaper, and greater quality, better results, because we're, if we're keeping track of data in, in a way, people's health data, technology, we'll, we'll see better results because fewer mistakes will be made. Thank you. Secretary Becerra, the White House conceded this week that it would not reach the goal of, by July the 4th, vaccinating 70% of adults. From the beginning of this vaccination campaign, I talked to public health experts who predicted a dramatic drop off. Why didn't the White House see this coming? Why weren't we better prepared? Well, I, I think that actually the White House and President Biden have done a great job to forecast where we're going. Uh, where we are today, compared to where we were the day before President Biden became president, it's a sea change. And uh, I don't fault the president for setting very ambitious goals, not just for his administration, but for the country. Uh, when he said we would get a million shots armed in his first 100 days, a lot of folks didn't know if that would be possible. Not only did we do it, but we went to 200 million shots in arms within the first 100 days. The president says high bars, and we have to know how to really high and fast, and we'll do as much as we can. 66% of adults in America have become vaccinated and or have been vaccinated. And while we were hoping that July we could say it's 7%, we still have uh, some days left before we get to July 4th. Good thing is you have a president that's going to push us really hard because at the end of the day, the harder we push and the more we get, the better for the American people. And you are now responsible for a new drive in some of the hotspots around the country to, to get the vaccine hesitant and young people. Can you tell me about new strategies and technologies that you are employing to reach those resistant groups? Well, we established a, a COVID health network uh, that helps us reach all parts of America. Some 12,000 uh, individuals, organizations, nonprofits have teamed up to be part of this core. Over a thousand physicians, by the way, are part of the and they've helped us reach out to all parts of America. We've also now established a COVID-19 youth corps where we have a lot of kid, younger people, 16, 17, 18, to serve as our youth ambassadors to help reach that population that is less uh, vaccinated. We're going to do everything we can, but the most important thing that we're now trying to do is we're going to go to who you are if you need to be vaccinated rather than wait for you to come to us. You know, a lot of people, because they have to work multiple jobs, They've got uh, family to have to think about after work, or if they're too far from the nearest site, or they're not, they haven't gotten all the right information. We want to make sure we do to make sure that if you are at all will be vaccinated, you get that back. So one of the things that's very striking is how political campaigns have honed their skills of targeting the persuadables, the middle group, the ones who go one way or another to vote. And it's very much the same thing with vaccines. Are you using the same sorts of social media tools to reach young people who are on the fence there in the middle? In, in many ways, that is absolutely. And 
Think of it this way. Political campaigns are happy when they get 50% plus one of the votes. And they consider it a landslide when, if you win an election by 55 or 56%. We're at 66%. And so in most cases, that, that would be considered a resounding success in politics. But we know we're not we're playing with the need to vaccine, vaccine people against a deadly virus. So 66% is great. The president will hope to get 70% real soon. But we want to get as close to 100% as possible. And so the game is not over until we make sure Americans are safe. So Dr. Fauci has warned that the Delta variants could cause a lot of problems in the future. I'd like to hear your views about that now and looking ahead as you're struggling to get these holdouts vaccinated. Uh, it's a scary thought. A very chilling prospect uh, to allow a variant like the Delta variant to sort of take over when it comes to COVID. And uh, what we know is that we have really good vaccines that help protect Americans against the COVID-19 uh, virus and disease. What we don't know is how quickly these variants will arise, the mutations that occur in the existing uh, forms of COVID-19. And we never know how well the current vaccines will protect against these newer coming variants. And so what we want to do is protect the population so that variants don't have a chance to take hold. And that's why it's so important. You may feel like you're an invisible 25-year-old, totally in good health, never had to visit a hospital, but you could be a carrier. And who knows, you could infect your grandmother who may have been completely vaccinated. But if you happen to be carrying a variant that is more powerful, than the existing uh, forms of COVID-19 in an infected person. It's unclear uh, how safe will be. And so the more we're protected against COVID-19 in all its forms, the better off we'll all be. And we have a responsibility to each other to make sure we're safe. So time to get vaccinated. We're still having a little bit of trouble with sound, but I just wanted to follow up on that or what I think I heard. So could we have a new variant that is actually more dangerous for young people if we let this virus just rampage across the parts of the country that are not well vaccinated? Francis, the, uh, the virus is always mutating and we never know what form it will take, but certainly when it mutates, uh, the forms that are more resilient against vaccine, forms that have more an ability to take over the body most are going to be the ones that worry us most, and therefore the ones that will survive against a good vaccine. And so, what we want to do is provide the blanket protection for society, so that these variants don't have a chance to take, that we can catch them before they spread too far. The Delta variant detected places like India first, but quickly, even though countries were trying to protect themselves, the UK. Uh, I remember being there about three weeks ago where they were getting close to opening up society again. And they were too, they were very concerned about it, but they didn't expect that the variant, the Delta variant would take over. Well, today that's sweeping through the UK. And now, of course, thought that it will become the dominant variant here in the US as well. The sooner we're vaccinated, all of us, the greater protection will have against the Delta variant. But the Epsilon variant, the variants that can be more, more difficult to beat down even with 19 has been so far. Secretary Becerra, we are having trouble, continued trouble with the sound. We're going to try and drop the signal and reconnect very, very briefly. So stay with us. It'll just take a second. Okay. Okay. Welcome back to Washington Post and welcome back to Secretary Becerra. And I think we can hear each other loud and clear now. Excellent, Francis. Good. So I wanted to talk about the new bills in the House and Senate um, with telehealth expansions. Are you in favor of making these expansions permanent? We are absolutely supportive of efforts to give us the authority to be able to utilize telehealth in greater ways. We want to make sure that uh, we don't leave anyone behind, as I said before, so that telehealth should be available to all Americans universally. And we want to make sure that that includes, of course, making sure broadband is uh, and, and quality broadband is out there for all communities, whether it's a rural part of the country or an inner city poor area of the country. And we want to make sure that there is accountability when these services are used. We want to make sure that Americans are getting a valuable service. We want to make sure that 
these providers are providing a service that might not have been available had we not had telehealth, but that it also re results in better quality services and treatment because we don't want to be billed for things that don't result in better health for Americans. Yes, just to follow up on that issue of equity, you mentioned broadband. Um, for all the advantages of telehealth, it does require the, the ability to have a smartphone and coverage. Um, do you see it could actually exacerbate inequity going ahead or do you see it as curing those problems? Well, not under my watch. Uh, we're not going to do things that increase uh, disparities. We're going to do everything we can to include everyone. It should make no difference what zip code you live in in America. You should have access to whatever technologies we as a government through our taxpayer dollars make available. And so that's why we want to make sure we do this the right way and that there's accountability on both ends uh, of the system. And by the way, uh, when we talk about this new type of healthcare, it could be visual or it could be audio. There, there, there are uh, circumstances under which you don't need to have a smartphone, you, a phone, any kind of phone might be enough. We just want to make sure that we're taking advantage of all the technology that lets us communicate with each other to make sure that we're also providing healthcare where possible. So I wanted to raise an issue that we talked with Dr. Resnick about earlier on, and that's licensure across states for telehealth. Um, during the pandemic, there was some relaxation. There's a there's a compact that allows some, uh, and there are some state agreements. What's your position on this? Do you believe that we should have uh, the ability for doctors to work outside their states? That that's again the accountability issue. Uh, if we're the farther away you go from the direct connection between patient and provider, the more difficult it will be to try to uh, provide for the accountability quickly and fairly for the patient. And so if your your doctor is 30 miles away and you live in rural America, we can track down that doctor 30 miles away from you. But if your doctor was 3,000 miles away from you, that's a tougher sell for a, a consumer who's now trying to get accountability for a service that wasn't properly provided. We've been talking a lot today about um, telehealth with individual health. You're obviously involved in rebuilding the U.S. public health infrastructure. What role will digital technologies play in that? Uh, Francis, probably a great deal. Uh, COVID-19 showed us where the holes are in our public health system. Uh, that's what happens when you have the most technologically advanced healthcare in the world but it's not evenly distributed. And as a result, we had pockets in America where COVID was devastating. And technology helps us close those gaps faster. Uh, but once again, we wanna make sure that technology is our friend and technology is being used properly. So accountability uh, will be so important. It helps that as a former attorney general, a state attorney general in California, to me, accountability is very important. And so we're gonna do a lot of bird dogging, a lot of oversight. And talk to me about the role of smart hospitals, which our previous guests uh, referred to a, a great deal. In the future, what is the role of smart hospitals? Well, the role of smart technology, period, whether it's in hospitals or whether it's at the mechanics uh, a shop, it's going to be critical because, again, it, it should give us faster service, uh, more uh, better quality service, and more reliable results, and the, ab the ability, we hope, to trace uh, do a, a quick chain of events, uh, find that chain of custody to what happened so that if the, in the event that there is something that didn't go right, you can quickly go back and follow that chain of custody to figure out where things went wrong and, and exact, exact accountability. And so hopefully technology will be our friend and let us do everything better and faster and cheaper. Secretary Becerra, you took a trip to Texas last week um, to the border. <clears throat> Could you tell us what HHS is doing to alleviate the situation of unaccompanied children coming across the border? Uh, Francis, important question. Thank you for asking. Um, uh, here in this country, uh, under our laws, uh, the Border Patrol Services, Customs and Border Patrol Protection Services, uh, they have the responsibility of uh, protecting the border and dealing with those at the border. But when it comes to children, especially if they are unaccompanied by any adult, uh, they must quickly, within a matter of three days or so, uh, relinquish control or custody of those children 
and place them in the hands of the Department of Health and Human Services as the now custodian of those children temporarily. Uh, since they don't have an adult custodian, we become their guardians for that temporary period of time. We must then, by law, provide them with the protection and safety uh, that you would expect a child to have. And so that's what we've been doing. The, the challenge has been that there have been a large number of these children who've crossed the border unaccompanied by an adult. And so we have had to move as quickly as we can to find a safe, proper place for these children to be cared for temporarily while they go through the immigration process. Usually that means finding a licensed care facility that can provide that service. Uh, because of the large number of children, uh, we have uh, and also because of COVID, COVID reducing the number of beds that these licensed care facilities have, we've had to turn to other uh, means of providing safety and uh, the type of basic services that these children uh, by law are entitled to receive. And so we've stood up these emergency uh, centers that we, uh, where we house the children, we provide them, we feed them, and we provide them with the basic care, medical care, behavioral health care, uh, and the services that they, they would need in the process of being transferred over to a custodian in the U.S. who could care for them while they go through the process. It's been a tough challenge, but we've done it uh, protecting these kids and uh, having been the Attorney General of California and actually taking on the previous administration for not doing it right. Uh, as I said from the very beginning, we're going to do this right. Secretary Becerra, I think I have time for one last question. You attended the G7 Health Ministers <clears throat> Conference. What was your biggest takeaway from that? Francis, I'd say probably the uh, the big smiles from my colleagues in the G7 that America is back and that we want to engage as a global partner and the amount of importance that people place in America being part of the world stage and being a, a fair and, and uh, critical partner. Uh, it is nice to be wanted. It is nice to be liked. And it is nice when you can help deliver results. And so it's great when President Biden gets out there and says that we're going to be providing more than half a, a billion vaccines for the world. Uh, it's a sign America is back. Secretary Becerra, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thank you, Francis. And apologies to you and to our audience for those technological difficulties. Uh, we will be back later on today. So please stay with us. My colleague, Jonathan Capehart, We'll be here at 12.30 with CNN chief media correspondent, Brian Stelter. I'm Francis Steed Sellers. Thanks so much for joining us. This is Washington Post Live.